Congress Lecture Series on Public Issues. Thank you for being here with us this evening. Before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Lou Douglas Lecture Series itself. Lou Douglas was a distinguished professor of political science here at K-State from 1949 to 1977 and was widely known for his power to inspire students, faculty, and citizens to instigate change. His work in pursuing justice for all was widely respected by those of all political persuasions. Because of his close ties with the UFM Community Learning Center, efforts were made to establish this lecture series in his honor. The series selects speakers who can extend our understanding of alternative perspectives on issues that affect us, regardless of any biases we may have. Topics traditionally pertain to human rights, social justice, world peace, and international development. At this time, I would like to thank the supporters of the Lou Douglas Lecture Series. The series deeply appreciates its funding from the Office of the President, the Office of the Provost, K-State's individual colleges, departments, and organizations, Student Governing Association, and private donations. Tonight's lecture by Mr. Norman Solomon is also being co-sponsored by the A.Q. Miller School of Journalism and Mass Communications. I would also like to thank some of those people who made this evening possible. UFM Director Linda Teener, Series Coordinator Olivia Collins, members of the Lou Douglas Lecture Series Committee, which is chaired by Professor John Flyter, and my fellow interns, Kristen Nichols, Tammy Jo Osborne, Miranda Bickford, and Patrice Holderbach. Thank you. Before our speakers introduce, I have a couple of announcements. First, following Mr. Solomon's lecture, there will be a book sale and book signing in the foyer of Formal Hall. Um, second, I would like to remind everyone that following the book signing, there will be a reception in the new K-State Alumni Center in Ballroom B, and you are all invited to join us. Um, and immediately following the lecture itself, there will be a question and answer period, and I, I highly encourage, encourage all of you to stay. I know you're all busy, busy students, but um, I think it will be definitely worthwhile. And there's two microphones up here. I'm sure you've all been at these type of lectures before. Just come on up. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Lori Bergen, Associate Professor for the A.Q. Miller School of Journalism and Mass Communications, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, and good evening. It's really a pleasure to be here representing the A.Q. Miller School of Journalism and Mass Communications this evening. And I wanted to... Uh, to Query you, first of all. Um, tonight, our speaker is billed as a media critic. And I wonder if you've all pondered on this, what exactly that might mean. Well, certainly, the job of a critic is not to just go around criticizing, uh, nor is it the job of a critic to simply pass judgment. Anybody can make an evaluation uh, without qualification. So essentially, the job of a critic is to point out what others fail to notice. And that's certainly the dimension upon which our speaker has succeeded. Norman Solomon is a longtime media critic and an investigative journalist. He's specialized in uncovering a myth, the myth that the major mainstream media tend to be liberally biased. He's a nationally syndicated columnist on media and politics, and his commentaries on media issues have ranged from why the media don't cover hunger in America to why the internet looks more like a global strip mall than a place for democratic discussion. His columns have appeared in a wide range of publications from the Boston Globe to the LA Times with the Kansas City Star in between. He's been a guest on just about every major news and public affairs program on television from the News Hour with Jim Lehrer to C-SPAN's About Books to CNN's Crossfire as well as Public Radio International's Marketplace and I think every program that's ever aired on national public radio, except maybe Car Talk. You can read the list of his books in, the, in your program. He's published nine of them in the last two decades, with his latest, The Habits of Highly Deceptive Media, winning the George Orwell Award for Distinguished Contribution to Honesty and Clarity in Public Language. It's an award presented by the National Council of Teachers of English. Norman Solomon is executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy, which is a nationwide consortium of public policy researchers and analysts, and he is an associate of the Media Watch Group FAIR. He's recently returned from Iraq, where he was a member of an independent American delegation taking part in a humanitarian mission 
and his speech tonight to you is entitled Media in Democracy, The Unfulfilled Promise. Will you join me in welcoming Norman Solomon? Thanks very much. A couple of years ago, I was in Brazil at a gathering called the World Social Forum, which had people from around the planet who were trying to deal with questions of mutual concern, environment, health, the economy, and democracy. And at that gathering, I heard the Latin American writer Eduardo Galeano speak. And he talked about walking through a Latin American city and seeing in big letters some graffiti on the wall. And it said, let's save pessimism for better times. And I think of that quite often, as a matter of fact, here on the campus today, speaking uh, to a class, the question came up, well, what about optimism and pessimism? Do you feel optimistic or pessimistic? And we wrestle with that a lot, I think, in our personal lives and looking at the events on the planet. And I think the answers that we find are not only in our heads or in our own lives day to day, but long term, because we certainly have reasons to feel both. A lot of times, you know, when we talk about what's in the news media, I think of a story, perhaps apocryphal, of the writer Gertrude Stein on her deathbed. And the story goes that she's at that point very weak and one of her dear friends says, Gertrude, before you go, what's the answer? And we're told that she sat up in bed and said, what's the question? And whether we're talking about public opinion polls or issues of media coverage, I think we often sooner or later need to come back to that matter of what is the question? Who's asking the question? How does the question get framed? What are the assumptions inside of the question? Because we know, for instance, in polling data, if a question is asked a certain way, it will get one sort of result. If it's asked a different way, it may very well get a very different result. And that kind of nuance is often missed in terms of media coverage. In times of crisis especially, we look to news media. Literally, we turn on the TV, we pick up the newspapers with more attention. That happened after 9-11. It's going to happen tomorrow, after the polls close, after the election polls close, and we look for the results. And so, you know, if we think about this question of democracy, and we've heard about democracy since we were very young, and we know that there are many democratic elements in our society, and we know that it's very, very far from perfect. And we hear about, you know, the body politic, and I compare news media to the circulatory system of the body politic. If there's blockage, you're going to have a problem with the health of that body politic. And I don't think there's any question that we have blockage now. We have blockage in terms of the ability of those of us who are in this country to get wide access to information and perspectives on a regular basis. Information that's going to affect our lives. We learned a lot in the last few weeks about snipers in the Washington, D.C. area. Meanwhile, by the way, millions of people were already marking their absentee ballots. And many others were getting ready to vote on November 5th. When we look back, and you know, this happens, it was a kind of mea culpa later on. Uh, remember, anybody remember way back Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding and those great, important, profound stories, Chandra Levy and Gary Condit and, oh yes, the shark attacks in the summer of 2001. Well, after 9-11, many journalists kind of sheepishly remembered what they had done, the resources they had put into Gary Condit and the shark attacks and they were embarrassed, but you know, it's, it's kind of like what's attributed, a statement attributed to Mark Twain. He said, uh, it's easy to quit smoking. I've done it thousands of times. It's very easy for the mainstream journalists to swear off that kind of pandering and sensationalism and chasing after ratings at the expense of democratic discourse and journalism until the next story comes along. And so the next story inevitably does come along. And, 
you would think that the most profoundly important event for your life in the month of October was sniping that went on in Washington, D.C. But we know there are some other, perhaps minor, perhaps not so minor matters that you might care about. You might care about what the economy is going to look like when you're out looking for a full-time, long-term job. You might care about health care that you or your loved ones have access to, or how polluted is the air that you breathe, or any number of other questions you might care whether your own country is dropping bombs on another nation far away. There are a lot of things that are of crucial importance that may get inadequate coverage in terms of quantity or quality. And so when we talk about democracy and media, absolutely central to our lives. We're in a situation now where one company called Clear Channel owns 1,200 different radio stations around the country, cookie cutter stations. You can drive from Maine to Southern California, Seattle to Florida, and you will hear the same stuff over and over again, even though the call letters are different. We, t we hear a lot about the need for campaign finance reform, and goodness knows there's a need for it. What about media finance reform? What about the fact that the AM and FM radio bands are supposed to belong to you and me? They're supposed to belong to the public, and they've been essentially hijacked by big money. And all you got to do to check out the results is to spin or flip the dial through the AM and FM band. You'll, you'll hear the kind of diversity that the so-called free market has given us. We do have the First Amendment. The First Amendment mentions the press, the only profession singled out for special protection in the United States Constitution. And yet we're in a situation where that First Amendment remains on the books, chiseled in stone. And meanwhile, huge corporations, large conglomerates are sitting on the windpipe of the First Amendment. And in many ways, I would argue it's gasping for breath. Now, this isn't a new problem. The media critic A.J. Liebling, who wrote for the New Yorker magazine half a century ago, put it this way. He said, freedom of the press is guaranteed to those who own one. And that was quite a while ago, and now we have the satellite uplinks and the mergers. You know, we, you, it takes some memory going back that it wasn't so long ago, 15 years ago, there was a company called Time and a company called Warner. In 1989, they merged to form Time Warner. During the 90s, they purchased CNN, which became part of Time Warner. And then a couple of years ago, we got this other merger called AOL Time Warner. The media critic who also worked at the Washington Post for years as assistant managing editor, Ben Bagdikian, has written six editions of the book called Media Monopoly, and every new edition has documented the diminishment of the number of corporations with dominant control over media. In 1983, when the book first came out, 50 corporations, through ownership, controlled most of the news and information flow of the United States. By the year 2000, that number had dropped to six. Plot that on a graph in your mind. Two decades ago, 50 corporations, now six. Every year that went by, every two years that went by, the number was dropping. It's moving in one direction. And whatever somebody's political ideology, liberal, conservative, moderate, libertarian, socialist, green, whatever, we all agree, at least in theory, that it's bad to put concentrated power in fewer and fewer hands. That's antithetical to democracy. And yet you look around the media landscape, which is absolutely part of the power system of our country, and the consolidation of media control is there. We all know about freedom to speak. That's part of the First Amendment, but implicitly also is the freedom to be heard. And if you think that freedom to speak is sufficient, I want to ask you to imagine that tomorrow we walk you off and put you into solitary confinement for the next few decades and we say to you that you have absolute freedom of speech. Say anything you want, no retaliation, no restriction. You'd have freedom to speak to the walls. And under the current government, corporate, so-called free market media system, that's totally sufficient. That freedom would be sufficient. You would have freedom to speak. And oh, by the way, you wouldn't have any freedom to be heard. 
But that's okay, because the letter of the First Amendment is being protected. Freedom to speak to the walls. But what about freedom to be heard? What about the notion that you can have democratic discourse and everybody in the society can be heard? Not just those with money, not just those with power, not just those with the right color skin or gender or social background, but that democracy has something to do with hearing from people in all walks of life, all kinds of backgrounds. And I'm afraid that someday we're going to be told that, well, you don't really even need a First Amendment. You know, the moderates, the moderates will tell us that you have a First Half Amendment, okay? First Half Amendment, and that's going to be sufficient. Maybe it will be called the Ashcroft Amendment. <laughs> and so you're supposed to be satisfied because, after all, you have freedom to speak. And that's going to be that. Well, I mean, obviously, many of us, whether we vocalize it or not, whether we're particularly conscious of this or not, feel some disquiet, some concern, maybe some anger. If you look at the world, it's not just a US problem, although these large conglomerates are mostly based in our country. In this world, the sun never sets on the AOL Time Warner empire, or the Disney empire, or the Rupert Murdoch News Corp empire. I mean that literally, that the sun never sets. When I was in uh, Brazil, I mentioned, and I get into the hotel in Porto Alegre, Brazil, and the first thing that I find when I turn on the TV is CNN International. And it's a fashion show. And the voiceover is saying, today's revolutionary woman prefers chiffon. And I proceeded to go to a conference that included some women you might consider revolutionary. And I got to tell you, I didn't see any chiffon all week. <laughs> so talk about media bias right there. Well, when this new century began, uh, January 2nd, 2000, there was a forum on CNN. And the participants included Gerald Levin, who was the head of Time Warner, you know, appearing on his, the network that he was the head of. And I'd like to quote for you what Mr. Levin had to say. He said, global media will be and is fast becoming the predominant business of the 21st century. He suggested, and I'm quoting here, that that global media may well be more important than government. It's more important than educational institutions and nonprofits, unquote. This privately owned Corporate media is going to be more important than governments? Interesting concept. We don't elect the board of directors of AOL Time Warner. Where's the democracy there? But they're going to be more important than governments? Than the government of this state? Than the government of this country? Educational institutions? Who's dedicated to the greater good? More. An educational institution? or Fox News Channel, or AOL Time Warner? And how about nonprofits, that they are less important as well? That we're supposed to go to the altar of the drive to maximize profits for the next quarter? And we're supposed to feel good about that? That's the message. So this is what he had to say. He went on to comment, what's going to be necessary is that we're going to need to have these corporations redefined as instruments of public service because they have the resources, they have the reach, they have the skill base, unquote. Well, that may seem kind of abstract. But if it seems abstract, let me say four letters, KKSU. Right here in this community, the kind of corporate hijacking of what should be a public resource has been taking place this fall. You know, I was down at the radio station on the campus today, and you'll see painted on the wall, KKSU, the voice of Kansas State University. If you don't stop this process, they're going to get out the turpentine, and they're going to get rid of what's painted on that wall. Because the voice of Kansas State University is about to be throttled, is about to be choked off. Now, how did this happen? It happened because news outlets themselves 
are the last sources to blow the whistle when public resources, when the public airwaves are being hijacked by private corporations. When somebody makes a deal, in this case, the people with the power to do so at this university, when people make a deal and say, oh, we'll sell it off. It's been here for seven decades, but that's okay. We're going to let some corporation based in some big city take our radio station from our university. And you know what? The student body, the faculty, they might gripe about it, but they're not going to make too much trouble. We'll find out in the days and weeks ahead if that assumption is true. And it's going to be up to you. Do we have a First Amendment? We know we have it in theory. But complacency is not going to give it life. Complacency is not going to allow people to be heard in their own communities without gatekeepers at large corporations deciding what should be heard and what shouldn't. The concepts of democracy were told sometimes with a wink and a nod. They're kind of antiquated. You know, get with the program. It's about the money chase. It's about going along to get along. These divine forces were told of technology, of big money. By the way, I'm sure some of you have seen on CNN the program Capital Gang. Right? You've seen Capital Gang. And I, for years I was watching that program. and There would be the, the silhouette of the Capitol Dome in Washington behind them. And I realized there's another meaning of why they call it the Capital Gang. It's the big money gang. It's both a metaphor and a literal example of why we hear who we hear in the mass media. The most important clues are when you look at the commercials and you find out who's paying for what's on cable television. Even setting aside who owns it. MSNBC opened, opened up a few years ago, owned by Microsoft and General Electric. Disney. Disney that now owns ABC. You may remember uh, the prairie populist Jim Hightower had a radio show, a national talk show on ABC during the mid-1990s. And um, a few days after it was announced that Disney was buying ABC, he came on for his regular show and he said, folks, you know what happened? All of a sudden, I work for a rodent. He was talking about Mickey Mouse. Um, as you might gather, he didn't have his job very long after that. So the capital gang, uppercase and lowercase, is really part of this whole process. Who's to be heard? Who's worth hearing? Who is coming at us day after day? How diverse are they? And how do they define problems? What about the crisis that they define? It's a crisis if I'm out of work. Is it a crisis if you're out of work? It's a crisis that I don't have a health care problem, or I do. If I can't get health care for my parents or myself, I consider that a crisis if it isn't adequate coverage. But maybe if I'm so caught up with myself, maybe if you have that problem, it's not a crisis. Well, if you're a network anchor, you're making several million dollars a year. You probably don't have those sorts of problems. The Media Watch Group Fair that I'm associated with did a survey of reporters at major media outlets, especially based in Washington, D.C., for these major ways that we get news in our country. And you know, we've heard all about the you know, liberal media, whatever that means. Our survey found, which was done academically, found that the reporters at these major outlets were more friendly towards corporations than the population as a whole when it was set side by side with Gallup polls of the country at large. They were more complacent. They were more happy with the power of Wall Street. They thought there was less of a problem with maldistribution of wealth in our society. You know, Adam Smith, centuries ago, said that labor creates all wealth. Adam Smith was not a radical. Adam Smith simply pointed out that it's labor, it's people's work, in this case, 100 million people in this country whose work creates wealth in our society. 
And yet to hear the pundits talk about it on the major media outlets, it's the other way around. It's the investors, it's the wealth that creates all labor. And that's reflected in we get, what we get through the news media. I mean, you pick up the, the Mercury or the Star or the New York Times or the San Francisco Chronicle, all of them have business sections. I can't find one daily paper in the United States with a daily labor section. And why is that? Just, you know, you walk into the newsroom of the Mercury or the Star or the Times tomorrow and say, hey, what gives? You can. It's a business section. There's no labor section. We'll say, what planet are you from? That's the way we do it. Power and precedent. It's not journalism. It's not journalistic precepts that have it that way. You listen to NPR News. In most parts of the country, they have NPR News, and then they have what they call NPR's business update. I'm still waiting for an NPR labor update. You have several, several of them a day in terms of NPR's business update. There's not a daily NPR labor update. There's not a weekly or monthly NPR update because we just work for a living. When was the last time Tom Brokaw or Peter Jennings or Dan Rather or Britt Hume reported on the wait times at emergency rooms in our country for people who don't have the coverage. Among the 40 million people have no coverage and many millions more with inadequate health coverage. What about on-the-job injury statistics? We ought to know about that. Preventable injuries in the workplace. We all know people have been injured on the job. Why isn't that as important as the uptick or the downturn of the Dow Jones Industrial Average and NASDAQ? Well, you know, it often seems that in news media we get a lot of lifestyles of the rich and famous, but there's very little about the lifestyles, if you will, of the poor and anonymous. And that notion that some people are really important and other people aren't so important, that extends to foreign policy coverage as well. The United Nations statistics tell us that during the next hour, well over a thousand children will die on this planet from preventable diseases. Pretty clear that a hefty fraction of what this country alone spends on armaments could prevent most of those deaths. And yet part of the process of leaving these concerns substantively unaddressed is something that George Orwell wrote about more than half a century ago. He put it this way. Those who control the past control the future. Those who control the present control the past. And so history gets whitewashed and rewritten and very, very carefully edited. I'll give you an example. Martin Luther King Jr. has his own holiday. We hear about him from time to time. The news media play one speech of his, 1963, I Have a Dream. Dr. King, the dreamer. Dr. King, the martyr on the postage stamp. But a little over a third of a century ago, when Dr. King was assassinated, he was helping to lead something called a Poor People's Campaign. And it was based on the assumption that everybody in the country had the right to health care and education and housing and employment. We don't hear about Dr. King who was fighting for economic justice in our country, who denounced poverty, who denounced racism, including institutionalized racism, and yes, who denounced militarism. We live in a society dominated by militarism. We live in a society where we're told that it is necessary for the United States to use its military might to do X, Y, and Z. The Time magazine that had on its cover the date September 10th, 2001, had this to say, and I'm quoting, and this is not attributed to anybody, this is a statement by Time magazine. The U.S. is at one of those fortunate and rare moments in history when it can shape the world, unquote. And if you've been overseas, you can reflect on, can you imagine walking around and telling people, hey, I'm from the United States, you know, the country that's shaping the world? 
arrogance, arrogance and power. The power to not only believe that might makes right, but to function on that basis. The most powerful military force on the planet, we know it, and we're going to use it. Well, if you go to Act 4 of King Lear, there's a statement, "'Tis the time's plague when madmen lead the blind." And I thought of that many times after 9-11. I thought of the madman named Osama bin Laden who led the blind to commit this heinous act of mass murder, the crime against humanity at the World Trade Center. A madman who would be followed to do such a crime. And I also thought about the unhinged aspects of policy at the White House. The belief that you can prove that violence is wrong by inflicting violence. That you can prove that it's wrong to kill innocent people by kill, killing innocent people. And just call it something else. And with a lot of mass media help, we experienced in the last 13, 14 months what we could call a bait and switch operation. The sadness, the fear, the grieving after 9-11. Had the American flag embraced by people around this country sincerely, put out in front of their homes, in front of their businesses. And then in a matter of weeks, when the missiles were flying in Afghanistan, paid for by you and me, that same American flag had been affixed on those missiles as well. And people living in villages in Afghanistan, no more guilty of anything than those who went to work that day on September 11th at the World Trade Center, they were killed just as brutally and just as violently. These are not easy perspectives for people to talk about or hear or have in our mass media. But if we're going to have wide-ranging debate and democratic discourse in our country, then it's essential, I think, that we go beyond stenography for the powerful. You know, talking about a war in Afghanistan, in the late 1980s, I was able to go to the Soviet Union and do some reporting from there for several weeks. And they knew how to run a war in the Soviet Union. They, know who, they knew how to drop bombs on Afghanistan and get news media at home to cover it in a way that was comfortable for the war makers. They just had the military operations and they had the journalists cover whatever the Kremlin had to say and everything was hunky-dory. They thought it was terrific. Well, in October of 2001, an ABC News reporter named Cokie Roberts was on the Dave Letterman show. This is what she had to say. Quote, I am, I will just confess to you, a total sucker for the guys who stand up with all the ribbons on and stuff, and they say it's true, and I'm ready to believe it. We had General Shelton on the show, ABC's This Week. The last day he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I couldn't lift that jacket with all the ribbons and medals. And so, when they say stuff, I tend to believe it, unquote. Don't want to pick on ABC. How about CBS's Dan Rather appearing on the same program September 17th? Quote, this is from a journalist, mind you. George Bush is the president. He makes the decision. Wherever he wants me to line up, just tell me where and he'll make the call, unquote. How's that for independent journalism? But what are the consequences of this? Well, I'm old enough to have a personal recollection in early August of 1964. The front page is covered with reporting on the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And if you go back into microfilm and look at the front pages of our finest newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, wire stories covered around the country, you will get absolute lies presented as absolute facts. And within three days, you had Congress passing 
Gulf of Tonkin resolution as close to anything we ever had to a declaration of war on Vietnam. What were the consequences? Well, among other things, 58,000 Americans killed in Vietnam, three or four million, depending on how you count them, people living in Indochina killed with U.S. tax dollars footing the bill. What were the consequences of lies being told and echoed and regurgitated by our mass media? Well, what would be the consequences now? We can only imagine. We can only imagine. It's never, whether in 1964 or 2002, easy to acknowledge the extent of what's being done in our names, with our tax dollars, with our, perhaps, acquiescence. And there's always that question, how do we get a more clear picture of what's going on in the world? And as we get some clarity, what, what can we do about it? A lot of reasons to be, as I mentioned, pessimistic. I recall the quote from Eduardo Galeano discussing the graffiti he saw about saving pessimism for better times. I remember something else that Galeano had to say at that session a couple years back. It was a comment he made. He said, power systems tell us that tomorrow is another word for today. And if we internalize that notion that tomorrow is simply another word for today, then we can go along to get along. Nothing wrong with the news media. It takes, it's said, a moment to tie a knot and much longer to untie it. The news media are tying familiar knots all the time, reinforcing old assumptions. It's very quick and easy to do. You can do that in an eight-second soundbite, reinforce what people have been told. It takes longer to put out other information and other sorts of analysis. And we are now in a situation, we're told, of perpetual war. Folks, this ain't going to end, right? That's what we're told. The war, quote, war on terrorism, unquote, is not going to end. The president tells us that. The news outlets tell us that. And meanwhile, meanwhile, we're told that because of this situation with terrorism, we've got to make some compromises. You know, the U.S. Patriot Act, these are great names, right? U.S. Patriot Act. Who can be against a Patriot Act, right? Very clever. There's a provision, I believe it's Section 215. I'm rusty on the number. I think that's it. That the FBI can go into public libraries and find out what you've checked out. And the librarian is forbidden by law to tell anybody that the FBI's done that. How do you like that? Land of the free, home of the brave. And your government, without any probable cause whatsoever, can find out what you're reading. But that's kind of you know, one domestic consequence of news media that are so busy being copacetic with the powers that be that they're not functioning independently. They're functioning less as a fourth estate than a fourth branch of government, de facto. And then, of course, there's this whole language called terrorism. Now, Reuters News Agency has a policy. They don't use the word terrorism unless it's in quotations from somebody else. And the reason they don't do that, I think, is a very good one. Because, for instance, the Russian government says that the people they're fighting in Chechnya are terrorists. And they want their eight, the agencies covering news in their country to call them terrorists, flat out. Well. What about other countries? India says people in Kashmir are terrorists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty soon, journalists are making all these sort of determinations. This person's a terrorist. This person's a freedom fighter, thus and so. And so the point Reuters makes is, let's let people make their own decisions. Let's describe what's happened and give the reader and listener and viewer credit for enough intelligence to make their own assessment. This is a very volatile topic because the basis of the messages from our government and our news media are often absolutely Orwellian. When our country is attacked and civilians are killed, that's terrorism. When our country attacks and civilians are killed, that's retaliation. 
After that, when our country is attacked and civilians are killed, you can't call that retaliation. That's terrorism. When the United States then responds by attacking, you can't call that terrorism. That's retaliation, or in the case of the buzz phrase, name that was given to attacks on Afghanistan, infinite justice. Right? Infinite justice. And then that name was changed because some Muslim people think only Allah can dispense that. What was the other term for it? Enduring freedom. Right? En enduring freedom was the operation name. And you know, I think our news media function kind of an irony-free zone. When you think we really look at that phrase, enduring freedom, it's supposed to be read one way. But it was about military operations that meant people in many villages had missiles arriving without notice to blow them up. And they ended up having to, well, they ended up enduring the freedom of the Pentagon to drop bombs on them. Now, you may agree with that interpretation, or you may disagree, but the point is, you weren't going to hear it on cable television because we don't have a wide enough array of discourse in our society to even have much debate along that line. Well, now we have something else brewing. We have Iraq. We're told that a war is almost inevitable. And the news media are playing clearly a major role, major role. Orwell put it this way, he said, uh, circus dogs jump when the trainer cracks his whip, but the really well-trained dog is the one that turns a somersault when there is no whip. And that's a good description of the kind of self-censorship that we have going on in the newsrooms. And I can tell you, I've been to the Washington Post newsrooms and the San Francisco Chronicle newsrooms, and there's no whips there. It's all very civil. They're not even getting faxes from the board of directors telling them how to report. There's freedom of the press. And it's precious. But it's limited. Because there's so much fear and so much self-censorship. You go up against the powers that be. You go outside the dotted line boundaries and it may not move your career very far forward. If you're Tom Brokaw, you don't need to be a rocket scientist or a social scientist to know that if you investigate General Electric's war profiteering, it may not be a career enhancer since General Electric is paying you a few million bucks a year as the owner of NBC. It's not exactly a way to move ahead. One more quote from Orwell. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. But a lot of the basics of our news media in this country is the opposite, is to tell people what it seems they do want to hear to maximize ratings. And the most important audience is comprised of the advertisers and the underwriters and the managing editors and the board of directors and the CEO. What do they not want to hear? Well, they don't want to hear any big boat rocking. You know. I think this is a good place to quote Dwight Eisenhower. When he left office, he talked about what he called the military-industrial complex. That was early 1961. That was just a baby military-industrial complex then. We have a really big one now, a really big one. And you might call it a military-industrial media complex. And a lot of the functioning of these media outlets, I think, sooner or later, or usually sooner and usually implicitly, is to encourage us through constant repetition and assumptions and themes that are played out, and most of all, perhaps, the silences, encourage us to recognize certain worthy victims and certain unworthy victims. You know, if Kurds are slaughtered and subjected to ethnic cleansing inside Turkey, which they have been over the past several years, it's not an issue in our news media. Why is that? Well, Turkey happens to be a member of NATO. It's a strong U.S. ally. No problem. Not an issue. You go across the border into northern Iraq, where Kurds have been slaughtered, 
and subjected to ethnic cleansing by Saddam Hussein's government. And this is a crime against humanity, which of course it is. But it's a crime against humanity committed, it happens, by a sworn enemy of Washington. Well, now, what kind of double think is that? The Kurds on one side of the border and being slaughtered, but it's not newsworthy? We're not supposed to get upset about it? Even though our own government's paying for it? But go across the border and now it's the reason that friends of yours in the military are supposed to go off to the desert and go to war in Iraq and we're supposed to pay for the missiles to be fired on Baghdad, where I was a couple of months ago, where people are pretty much like you and me, have their same fears, their same hopes. We're supposed to feel good about that because the news media tell us so. How can that be? How can we be encouraged to accept it? We all know the line, ask not for whom the bell tolls, but there's a different message from the news media of our country, the stenographers for the powerful. Between the lines they're telling us, ask for whom the bell tolls. If it's a Palestinian who's killed with our tax dollars through the Israeli government, unfortunate, not a big deal. If it's an Israeli killed by a Palestinian, it's a crime against humanity. Well, what's wrong with this picture? Why, why the disparity? How can this be? How can it be that we're told that if and when, and we're told it's going to be when, the US government launches massive attacks on Iraq, we're supposed to feel good about it. Let me, before I close, mention a couple little facts that aren't so little that are relevant to this question of Iraq and to the question of how in our democratic society our news media don't tell us some fundamental facts. In his book, 1984, George Orwell, George Orwell described doublethink this way. The process has to be conscious or it would not be carried out with sufficient precision. But it also has to be unconscious or it would bring with it a feeling of falsity and hence of guilt. To tell deliberate lies while genuinely believing in them, to forget any fact that has become inconvenient, and then when it becomes necessary again to draw it back from oblivion for just so long as it is needed, to deny the existence of objective reality and all the while to take account of that reality, which one denies all this, is indispensably necessary, unquote. And I would add, if you look at Aldous Huxley's introduction to the book Brave New World, he talks about, this way he puts it, lies are powerful, but even more powerful is silence about truth. The silence about truth. That's the biggest way that our news media function. The biggest and most powerful way. If you look at the question of Iraq, you will hear Donald Rumsfeld continually. You will hear members of Congress. You will hear members of network news staffs tell you that Iraq kicked out the UN weapons inspectors in December of 1998. Interesting if true, but false. An absolute and flagrant lie. All you got to do is go back into the Orwellian memory hole, look at the coverage in December 1998, and you find that the United Nations withdrew the UN weapons inspectors because the Clinton administration told the inspection team that it was about to bomb. This was subsequently known as the Monica Lewinsky bombing, you may remember. It was right before impeachment. Also known as Desert Fox. Four days of missiles fired into Baghdad. After, not after the Iraqis kicked out the weapons inspectors, which they did not, but after they were withdrawn. And then, in January of 1999, if you go to, and anybody who doubts this, be my guest, go to the archives, New York Times, January 7th and January 8th, 1999. Also check out the Washington Post for that time period. End of the first week of January 1999. Front page in the New York Times. United States used UN inspection teams in Iraq to commit espionage. 
down the Orwellian memory hole, within 48 hours, sank like a stone as a story. And now you'll read occasionally, I read this in USA Today a few weeks ago, Iraq has accused the United States of using the UN weapons teams for espionage. Is that a heck of a way to report a fact that somebody accused it of happening? That's a little bit strange. And by the way, if you look at the New York Times and Washington Post stories, what are the sources of that out, out, outright factual statement? U.S. officials never subsequently denied. U.S. officials said that they had used the UN inspection team for espionage. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, the whole mission, the whole authorized activity of those inspectors was to look for and help in the destruction of weapons of mass destruction, not to help the United States government pinpoint its targets for subsequently bombing Iraq, not to leave homing devices as took place to help them try to assassinate Saddam Hussein. They left electronic beepers and so forth to make it easier for the Pentagon to subsequently attack. Well, why do I go into all this? Because right now we're being told that it's essential for the UN inspectors to go in, but for some reason the Iraqi government, which by the way is a very repressive and brutal regime, there's no question about that, but we're told that you know, we don't know if the Iraqis will totally comply with the inspections. And you look at the draft resolution, and anybody would like to see a deconstruction of it, go to the web, the Institute for Public Accuracy, where I work. We've done a complete analysis of George Bush's Cincinnati speech in early October and the draft U.S. resolution for the United Nations Security Council. We're told that, hey, they've got to let these inspectors in, and you look at the terms. And the terms are the United States wants to be able to have enormous effect on what that team does. And there are no protections or guarantees that the same thing won't happen again. And everybody knows that the United States is planning to attack Iraq. When I was in Baghdad and I was part of a delegation, including former U.S. Senator Jim Abarask and current Congressman Nick Rahal of West Virginia. We sat with Tariq Aziz and he said, you know, delaying this war may not, may not be such a good thing. And we were looking at him like he was nuts. And then he explained. He said, well, we delay the war. The inspectors come in. There's no guarantees that what happened before won't happen again. And the Pentagon essentially will have a more detailed map to help them target exactly where to send their missiles for maximum effect on our country. Well, I'm not sure, but I doubt that in the mass media you've heard about that very often. I just don't think so. Because in Orwellian fashion, it's down, down the vacuum tube. Well, I'm really glad that I had a chance, have a chance to be here with you this evening. Um, the Lou Douglas Lecture Series, sponsored by the UFM Community Learning Center, co-sponsored by H.J. Miller School of Journalism and Mass Communications. None of them, as they say on the radio and television, none of them should uh, be held accountable for the views that you've heard. They may or may not agree. But I think it's essential that we not see history as something that we consume like a product that we pick up at the store. History is being made all the time. It's being made by what we do and what we don't do. And in part, what happens in the future is up to you. Thank you very much. People uh, analyzed a problem, they researched it, and they organized. And unfortunately, the mass media, and I would add schools, don't teach us how to organize. Often they teach us how not to organize. They teach us to be passive. They teach us to consume. They teach us to believe that history is made by, you know, the, 
the few smart people up there who are going to do it, and you know, if we're lucky, they will come to the fore and we'll follow them. Or is this really about, about organizing? And I, so I don't have an answer about how it would be easy. But I do think it's possible. You know, questions of, of corporate power have come to the fore with Enron and Halliburton and Harkin, and some of those stories that were in the news for a while. And uh, I think it, it means dealing with questions of who controls the airwaves, for one thing. I mean, I think that's something that we need to address, whether it's KKSU or any other number of stations, where we need to hang on to where the airwaves have not yet been privatized and also challenge the mainstream media because essentially, since they have hijacked the airwaves from the public, we need to make a strong case for taking the airwaves back. Uh, two uh, comments and two questions. Um, first, uh, they just started handing out the New York Times on campus, and there was a labor section one day last week. I don't know if this is a regular thing or not. It was nice to see that Lawrence, Kansas had the second fastest growing job market in the United States. Um, the other comment is, you know, uh, another good title for your talk would have been um, Media and Capitalism, because I believe that the major media outlets are whores, and they'll show whatever the people are con going to consume. So I think the bigger problem is not so much what the media puts out, but to get the people, you know, the population in general, to demand more of their news media. Um, so my two questions are, one, um, where should I get my news then? Because, you know, what, what do you consider good news sources? And then the second question is, being that you're just from Iraq and we're about to go to war in Iraq, how do the people, how do the Iraqi people feel about it on the street? I mean, do they support the United States coming in there and, you know, liberating them from mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein or... <laughs> or do they like their government or what? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, in terms of people who can uh, challenge news media, that's essentially the gist of your first question, if I understand it. What can people or, do about it? No, the first question is where should I get my news? Where you get your news, okay. Well, uh, the, the news, I think, is best uh, coming from a lot of different sources. I mean, I can't recommend any gospel. I think we need to think critically from any source. Anybody standing in front of a podium, including myself, thinking critically. Um, <laughs> and not looking for, you know, just one source of wisdom. Uh, and that to me means looking at mainstream media. I mean, I encourage people to read the New York Times. And by the way, I mean, that's an anomaly. They have a section called labor. They don't have a regular section called labor. You look at business sections, by the way, enormously expanded in the last dozen years in terms of number of pages and so forth. Um, I encourage people to read the local daily paper, read a national daily paper, look at the news magazines, and also look elsewhere. Uh, people say, well, what about alternative right-wing sources? I say, like, alternative right-wing sources. Now, this is because we don't get enough right-wing views when we watch Fox News Channel, <laughs> when we read George Will, uh, when we're listening to Rush Limbaugh. I mean, I, not a problem. We already, we're already getting that. Uh, I think we need some alternative progressive left sources. I'd recommend uh, magazines, The Nation, The Progressive, published out of Madison, Wisconsin, National Ca Catholic Reporter, I believe it's out of Kansas City, uh, in these times, Z Magazine, a lot of good websites, uh, commondreams.org, if I was going to rep recommend one, www.commondreams.org. The Media Watch Group Fair that I mentioned, fair.org, critiques mass media with factual analysis and documentation, uh, accuracy.org at the Institute for Public Accuracy, 150 news releases a year, getting out information that generally doesn't reach the public through the mass media. And um, also, I think, creating our own outlets, because None of those are going to tell you what's going on in Manhattan, Kansas. I mean, they're really not. And so if you have an existing, you do have a collegiate here, um, see what you can do to invigorate it. If you have a daily paper here, uh, the, the Mercury, talk to them about what isn't being covered. If it's a problem, local TV or the daily isn't doing what's needed, do some research, make the case. Consider um, an informational leafleting and picketing campaign. You know, we've been encouraged to believe that it's somehow against the First Amendment to pick at a media outlet. I think it's wrong to say that. It's the opposite. We're invigorating the First Amendment by saying not only with the people with big bucks or capital behind them should be heard. You know? So nothing wrong with getting out the picket sign and going down to the local newspaper or broadcaster. Um, but ultimately, we need to, I believe, create and sustain independent media outlets that are non-corporate and also um, try to push mainstream outlets as well. People in Iraq, well, it's hard to generalize. I mean, people have asked me, uh, you know, what about civil society in Iraq? And my answer is, as far as I can tell, there is no civil society in Iraq. It's such a brutal dictatorship. 
At the same time, I talked to some, and, and I went to meetings mostly in Iraq. I talked to people around the hotel. I was only there for five days. I talked to reporters there who were there for months, British and other reporters. And um, they said it's absolutely clear to them uh, that um, many Iraqis hate and certainly fear Saddam Hussein, but even stronger is hatred of the United States because of the bombing and the sanctions. And that's a whole other story. We maybe don't have uh, time to get into it. But the, the U.S.-led sanctions are responsible for several hundred thousand deaths of children. It's not a matter that Saddam Hussein is spending the money on palaces instead of clinics because there are embargoes enforced by the UN, UN's 661 committee through the Security Council where the United States is blocking so-called dual-use technology like centrifuges, medical infusion pumps, uh, some chemotherapy drugs and so forth. Uh, you may remember in 1996 on 60 Minutes, Leslie Stahl asked the Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, who articulated a policy in place essentially still today through this administration. She said, 500,000 Iraqi kids killed by U.S.-led sanctions. How can you justify that? And the Secretary of State said, well, it's difficult, but, quote, we think it's worth it, unquote. We think it's worth it. Well, so if you talk to Iraqis, they hate the United States for that. And they know that bombs may be coming again. So, no, these are not generally people who will look at the U.S. as liberators. They, they view them as terrorists. They view Americans as terrorists. And it's hard to argue with them in that context. Yeah. Um, about your labor page, uh, what <coughs> news would you present that would be markedly different from your general business uh, news? Yeah. I interviewed a reporter named David K. Johnston, who was a business reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer and, and is now, uh, a dozen years later, a business reporter, a Pulitzer Prize winner at the New York Times. And he described it this way. He said, the business pages report on banks through the eyes of bank managers, not through the eyes of bank customers. And in a similar way, the business page uh, pages tend to report on economic and uh, business-related issues from the vantage point of the investors and the owners and the managers. So I think we need to flip that around. What's it like uh, to work for a living? What are on-the-job uh, injury statistics? Uh, what are the real effects of job stress? What are the implications of the kind of jobs we have uh, for people's mental health and physical health? What are the uh, prospects for workplace democracy, which is almost a taboo subject in our society? You know, the corporation that we work for, if we work for a corporation, may have more effect on our daily lives than other elected officials, and yet uh, it's off the media map to even discuss the prospect that we would have some form of workplace democracy. So I think uh, it's almost hard to conceive of because we're so far from that place. Uh, for instance, I mentioned NPR's uh, business update. Well, NPR labor update could really give you uh, up-to-the-minute reports on the latest statistics on the job injuries and so forth. Would people be interested in that? Well, I think so. For one thing, it would sensitize us and make more of a political issue about preventable workplace injuries. And we're not just talking about deaths or crippling uh, injuries. We're talking about uh, repetitive stress uh, and so forth. I mean, I'm sure people here know others who have been affected with, you know, basic motor functions because of their working conditions. That could be a major source of coverage on an ongoing basis. Um, we criticize journalists for biased reporting, but really how much freedom do nurse, news journalists who are on networks really have to report as they wish, say like Dan Rather? Well, I think they have the kind of freedom that your doggy has on a leash. Uh, <laughs> I'm assuming you have a, a doggy, but, but those of you who do. If you don't tug on the leash, you have all the freedom in the world. And you may have the illusion you have all the freedom. Because I've had this happen a lot. I'm on a talk show or I'm speaking with a journalist. They'll say, nobody ever tells me how to report, which is wrong in at least in two ways. It's incorrect in two ways. First of all, they're told all the time. It's called editing, you know, often under the guise of news judgment. It's just, no, we just don't do those kind of stories, and people get the message. But it's also uh, the fact that people understand by example, intuitively, explicitly or not, what would happen if they do tug on the leash. And so they, they basically, if they don't tug, there's not, there's not any inner dissonance, no cognitive dissonance necessarily, and it's not, a, it's not a conflict point. So that question of freedom, like Orwell said, uh, 
liberty means anything, it means the freedom to tell people what they don't want to hear. If these journalists are not telling people what their bosses would prefer that people not hear, it's, it's not a conflict. So I, I guess it's a hopefully a nuanced answer. People have some freedom and some independence, but there's a lot of stressors there and a lot of limits. I can guarantee you if you're at Fox News Channel and you want to do an investigative series on Rupert Murdoch, it ain't going to happen. Towards the beginning of your speech, you uh, spoke a lot about the freedom of the speech and kind of the, the right to an audience and how corporations own almost all TV and radio outlets. Like, there's a really high barrier of entry. And then later in your speech, you mentioned how it's almost impossible to separate government and what the government wants to hear from the corporations. But I don't really find that surprising considering the authoritarian FCC government regulations that grants each corporation their permission to broadcast to the people. Um, could the answer be liberating mass media from that government bureaucracy to minimize the barrier of entry for grassroots people like myself and removing some of the direct government influence on that mass media? Well, I mean, the, we're undergoing deregulation right now. Chairman Powell of the FCC has been moving further and further in the direction of saying we're going to have fewer and fewer regulations, which makes things worse and worse because you can, in a major city, have uh, eight different radio stations owned by Clear Channel or some other corporation. So. I think the more, quote unquote, deregulation there is, uh, then the more we have the airwaves devoured by these huge companies. It's a capital intensive industry. You, know, you drive around the country and you'll hear the same thing for that reason. You know? um, there is micro broadcasting, as it's been called, or people who are low power broadcasters. And there's been a big fight over that because the commercial broadcasters don't like that. But it's, it's kind of a skirmish in a huge battle that I'm afraid has largely been lost. I mean, that's why I talk about KKSU, because to lose that is a tragedy. And people have got to defend what they have, or they absolutely won't have it anymore. The issue of deregulation, I think, deregulation is a code word, unfortunately, for giving away the store to huge corporations. And I think that's true with the airwaves as well. Just one thing. I appreciate the great dialogue we're having here. Um, these two gentlemen will have the last two questions of the evening. And then um, I'd like to remind you that after this, again, we'll have the book sale and the signing after this. And then following that will be the reception, um, K-State Alumni Center, Ballroom B. And you're all invited. So please come join us. Do you think we, the people, the consumers, uh, would ever want better journalism? Hmm. Well, Linda Ellerby, who's kind of a maverick uh, journalist, uh, put it this way a number of years ago. She said, you know, the th she says, I'm tired of hearing this thing about how we in the uh, broadcast industries are just giving people what they want. She said, that's just our excuse for, I'm quoting her here, that's just our excuse for putting dreck on the air, she put it. Uh, she said, uh, people will watch uh, trash TV, junk TV, the way they'll watch a house burning down in their neighborhood. Um, he says, it doesn't mean they want to spend their lives watching houses burn down. People can't choose from choices that aren't available. You know, if I have a choice between uh, watching, you know, God help me, you know, Bill O'Reilly or Ashley Banfield or something, or Survivor, or watching some totally low tech, super low budget, maybe black and white, maybe out of focus, public access show that has no resources or production values behind it, you know what I'm probably going to watch. Uh, but if we had resources going into really well-produced journalism, for instance, I think people would watch. It has to be available. If it's not available, they can't watch it. One of the things that's happened also is, yeah, we get more channels, but they're still owned by a few huge corporations, the gatekeepers and the channels, the networks themselves. And also, uh, they're really in a process of giving us uh, variations on a theme. You know, it's called narrow casting, but it's not particularly diverse. I mean, we're going to have one day a golf uh, channel for people who are left-handed and are having problems with their slice, you know. <laughs> uh, and we'll say, hey, you know, diversity, we really have all these channels to choose from. My favorite media critic is Bruce Springsteen, you know that song, 57 Channels and Nothing's On? But I think it's going to be redone, it's going to be 500 channels and still nothing on, just about. This is a, this is just a, it's a very sincere question. Um, I, I do like a lot of internet research because I, I, I do a lot of work on it on, on the internet. I mainly work with music, but you know that brings in everything else in the world. You know that responds to. But uh, 
something that, that I, just, I just can't understand is why there are not scandals in the media about President Bush like there were about so many pre previous presidents when the scandal issue was so much less. You don't hear that the Bushes and Bin Ladens are a long time, you know, they've been doing business together for years and years. You don't hear that both of the Bush presidents constantly had all their policies, you know, as presidents affected by direct, you know, conflict of interest between their own families, financial interests in oil and weapon trading in the Middle East and, and so on. Uh, you know, that affected their public service. They made a decision based on what was good for their family, not for, for America or anything else. It, it, these things are, are like major. There's like all kinds of places on the net. If you know where to look, you can find them. Uh, why, why isn't it on a scandal? Like, like there's been other scandals. The media was willing to go after previous presidents. What's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we might ask. Well, I think the information you mentioned has been reported occasionally in some major media outlets in passing, rarely on the front page, sometimes on the front page. But the essence of propaganda is repetition. And the news stories that have the most propaganda effect are in what you could call the media echo chamber. And we hear it again and again and again. So, for instance, you may have heard that Saddam Hussein gassed his own people. Does that sound familiar? You know, you've probably heard that once or twice. Or if you watch a lot of TV, 50 times. But you're not hearing about the use of the UN for espionage by Washington, just for example. Uh, so things are reported. And it's a very interesting dynamic if you call up newsrooms and you raise some of these questions. They'll say, oh, yeah, we reported that. And sometimes they really did report it. you know. And they say, well, it's old news. We didn't report it very well. We reported it in passing, essentially. But now it's old news. And so we don't need to deal with it. And it's kind of an inoculation process where there are cracks in the walls. I think we need to find ways to make those cracks larger. But in the overall uh, structure of news media, we have just these sensibilities where journalists are way too close to power. In fact, are often employed by these very powerful institutions. So as always in history, it's up to us to make the changes because they won't be handed to us. The great abolitionist Frederick Douglass said it very well. Power never concedes anything without a struggle. It never did and it never will.